Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today we're going to be talking about church bells. That's right. We're going to take a look at bells. We're going to share things with you you didn't know about why the Catholic Church uses bells, some of the sacramental theology around them, and the history of bells in the church. Tintinabulation. That's what we're talking about. Ring my bell. Ring my bell. Ding dong. Ding, 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 dong. Keep the head ring. Thanks for that intro, Father Rich. Yeah, no problem. Well, yeah. that was kind of a contribution of all of us, right? That was. Yeah. Della Cross ring, ring, ringing his ding, personal ding, bell no. of his ice cup here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, bells are one of those things that are so, you know, intrinsically tied to the church. I mean, Absolutely. It, it's the church bells. You hear a bell ring in the, in the, in the you know, parish square, you think it's time for church. And, and the greatest apostasy of recent history is digital bells. Oh, mm. digital bells. Don't get us started on that. Oh, boy. Yeah. So... The real bells that we use day in and day out, you know, for churches at large, you know, it's very important. You know, like we have Sanctus bells here, which we'll get into a little bit later, but the the toll and the pitch that a bell makes, it really does have an effect psychologically and spiritually. And what we're going to get into in this episode is going to blow your mind. Yeah, we're sharing some really cool things that you never knew about church bells. We're going to be talking about how they're consecrated, how they can ex, um, expel demons and fight the dark forces, uh, how they were used as uh, secret code during the Middle Ages, and so much more. It's going to be a really interesting mm-hmm. episode. I like it. Now, there is one bell that should be rung. <laughs> Before this episode gets starts, and you know what bell that is? That's right next to the subscribe button. I thought so you if hated you're... digital bells. No, I love the <laughs> digital bell on YouTube, okay? Because right next to the subscribe button, which you should have already hit, but if you have not, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button, click the bell every time we produce a show, you'll know about it. And if you want to know more about our show and where you could view or listen our, to our content... Go to CatholicTalkShow.com. There is a ton of stuff on there, especially if you're considering becoming a financial supporter of the show. If you go to CatholicTalkShow.com forward slash Patreon, you'll see every way that you could support us, and we've got some awesome gear we want to send your way to say thanks. That's right. So I think the the history of bells and the usage of bells— the good place to start is the Old Testament. We always try to start in the Old Testament to show the continuity of the usage of things in the faith— uh, and that could, this goes back to the um, to the temple, temple worship. And in the temple, there was the Holy of Holies, right? And only the high priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies one day a year, okay? Now, that, that creates an inherent problem. If only one person can go in there, and it's holy, and no one else can go in there, they had the dilemma of, what if the high priest dies while he's in the Holy of Holies? You're not going to be able to go in there until there's a new high priest next year. So you don't want a Uh, rotting body of a high priest in the Holy of Holies for a year. That's nasty. It's very nasty. So the high priest would have tintabula, little gold bells tied Tied around around his waist waist, so that you could hear him moving. Mm -hmm. And if the bells stopped moving for too long, you knew that the priest had died. What if he accidentally touched the ark or something gets struck down? So they would tie a rope around his waist so if the bell stopped ringing, they could pull him out without having someone to go in there. Oh, man. Isn't that fascinating? The history of bells and what they symbolize, especially as it relates to temple worship, is something really fascinating as you see the development of the use of bells throughout Christianity mm-hmm. and who the person of Jesus Christ is, the word, the logos made flesh, echoing into the world a harmonious sound of unity and concord, the effect of that reverberation is a sound that we could still hear today. And the bells symbolize that in different ways. But, you know, when when you look at the temple worship and what you just what you just shared, you know, how cool is it that, you know, a high priest <laughs> who is kind of this uh, foreshadowing to Jesus Christ mm-hmm. would be wearing at his waist bells. It's just a cool, it's a cool concept. It really is. And again, it, that kind of develops into the call to worship, right? And that's where bells really, you know, started ringing, right? Is 
how do you let people know it's time to get to mass? It's time to get to prayer. Uh, in the very early church, they'd use all kinds of methods. Sometimes they would blow trumpets. Sometimes they would clank wood together really loud. Um, they sometimes they just yell. You know, sometimes they go up on the top, you know, high tower. And at different times in the history of church, that was either more difficult or more um, had to be more clandestine. Um, but around the six in the sixth century. They started using bells to say it's time to go to church, and it kind of standardized from trumpets or from choirs. They didn't have emails; you couldn't text and be like, "Hey, yeah. you know." Well, and, and and a lot of those churches were built in villages mm-hmm. where people walked to church all the time, mm-hmm. and and they, you know, it was just a part of the culture. Yep, mm-hmm. and these were the first. They were called tintambula, right? They're mm-hmm. small little bells, and they'd ring them, and you'd hear them, and you'd say, "Okay, it's time to go to church." Now, this, and that was the word that I used at the the, the yeah. very core of the Latin word tintinabulation is is like the tolling of bells, and that that being tied to church history, it's always a calling. It's it's communicating something. So you think of Morse code, right? Mm-hmm. It's like this was this was before Morse code. You know, this the bells communicated a lot. It's a call to call to prayer. It also communicates the death of someone. You know, when a holy father dies, you know, when the bells toll, mm-hmm. you know, there were different tolls, which we'll get into a little bit later, but for the death of a man, a woman, a child, so that you could communicate to a whole village, hey, this has happened. Yeah. And and if you know and you're coming to the Sunday congregation because wow. the bells are calling you to church, you also know that, you know, Naaman is is dying. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we're all praying for Naaman. You know, he's coming to, to his, you know, near his death. And then when you hear it, it's like, ah. Naaman just passed. Yeah. yeah and the whole community amazing. knows. Naaman just died in their b- homes. the day before his Briscoe Peak coal train. I mean, people are dropping like flies. Good thing yeah. we have the bells to let us know that this exactly. is happening. Um, poor Naaman. Poor Naaman. <laughs> he didn't deserve it. Only the good die young. Um, so the development of church bells really came from those two things, right? Number one, the call for the sounds of joy in worship and to call worshipers to times of mass. You couldn't text people. They didn't have bulletins. They didn't have a sign outside of the you know house churches or whatever. Um, but there is a proper name for a church bell. It's not just called a bell. And this goes back to the origin of the larger bells that we see. Because in the beginning, like you said, it was this tintinabulum, mm-hmm. very small bells, more mm-hmm. like this, mm-hmm. you know, tiny. But now we start getting these huge bells. And that development happened later when the advancements in the ca- in, um, casting, metal casting, casting technology. Yeah. And the name of a church bell, the proper name, is a campagna. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And uh, Father Rich, I, you know, you having been all through Italy, I'm sure you know where that comes from. That comes from the region mm-hmm. of Campania. Mm-hmm. Okay? Because that was where they were known for best casting metal. You know, they were casting doors, bells, whatever. That was their kind of their, their trade. Mm-hmm. So a proper name for a church bell is a campania. Mm-hmm. And that comes from the, the Greek root, kapenia, which means like it's, it's like a helmet. So like the shaping of it is is a form of a, mm-hmm. of a helmet. Mm. I didn't even know that, Daddy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. A... Um, so that's why, like, if you ever heard the term like bats in the belfry, mm-hmm. okay, or a bell tower, there's there's actually particular names for those that have specific meanings, right? And a lot of times I think you think you hear belfry and you think of a church bell, right? Uh, you think of um, you know the bells of Notre Dame and Quasimodo up there yeah, ringing and stuff. That's the first thing that I think of, right? Is the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, but the the campanile is actually the tower that's associated with the church mm-hmm. that has the bell in it, and it's a campanile because it comes from the campana, right? Whereas a belfry. It has a you know a really separate meaning. It's more of an English use, um, but that's you know something that's a pretty cool little distinction mm-hmm. that there is a specific name to the structure, mm-hmm. to the bell. You know everything we do in the church and, has purpose. And to the and to the region like like we're mentioning in Campania, what what comes out of that location and production is is bronze. Mm-hmm. So you know the the bells being made of bronze, this being used identified by the popes uh, specifically in the in the fourth in the fifth century, mm-hmm. um, and the use of bells, you know, from in the Middle Ages, 
you know, it became a common practice. So it, it really generated from Italy, adopted by these popes, and then it started to really be established throughout every church in these towers, these church yeah. towers. Yeah, so the tower itself is the campanile, like the little room on top mm -hmm. with the bell, that's the belfry. Yeah. Now, what's probably the most famous campanile in the world? And I, you'll, you'll know this once you hear it, that you probably don't even think of it as one. Mm -hmm. It's the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That was built as a campanile. That was a church bell tower. Huh. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, so did the Orthodox use <coughs> bell towers? I don't recall seeing any with the Orthodox or like the Greek Orthodox, or I don't recall really seeing them the, the use of bells with hmm. uh, other rites. You know, I like, I like the little ones, like the tintamalum. Yep, That's right, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so no, I, I, you know, obviously those are used in the liturgy, but I, I haven't seen any real bell towers like for Orthodox churches. You know, I can't say that I've ever. Yeah. Noticed, but you they they use bells within the liturgy. No, I know, absolutely. I know that, but like all, all, all the right use of, like the Byzantine bells of Saint John Theologian Monastery at Patmos. Um, there's a number of monasteries, yeah, the, and and Byzantine churches and Eastern Orthodox okay. churches that do have bell towers. They're they're designed um, differently, but where that was adopted in their history, uh, bells were introduced in Russia simultaneously with the baptism of Rus in 988, coming to the Eastern the Slavs. So you know they kind of picked that up a lot later than us. But but again, it's like. Where where it comes from, this this is where it comes from. How it started to affect Christianity in in all of the rites, yep. you know, it is definitely tied to the greater history mm -hmm. that I believe we're talking about in the Old Testament and Exodus and yep. Leviticus, Deuteronomy, where where you're seeing the use of bells with the high priest, with ritual practices. Um, so the resonance of this practice is something that needs to be <coughs> preserved in our lineage. Yeah. Um, and that's why I do genuinely believe that digital sounding tolls and, and digital Are they the bells, speakers? They're speakers. In oh, a, what in, a in travesty. In, in a belfry. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, they can literally hang a bell in there. Yeah. And, and it's just, it, it's tragic. It, it, it's, a form it's, of, it's a form of apostasy, I, yeah. I, I think. It's apostasy laziness. strong, but it's, it's, it's a strong, but, but that's, a bull, that's if, some B crap, bro. If you look, <laughs> if you look at, at the effect of what bells have, as we get deeper into the show, you're going to see the ministry of the bell, mm -hmm. essentially. The fact that you would never baptize a speaker with a, with a f fake facade of a bell, mm -hmm. you know, like you aren't going to christen Something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, they really become sacramentals. How can you sacra sacramentalize a digital thing? Because we are incarnate uh, beings, and we use the elements of creation in our worship and in our life. We don't even use them anymore. I know, it's a tragedy. Like, we don't even use them. My mm -hmm. parish was built in the 70s or the 60s, and there's no bell tower. Mm -hmm. There's no. not even a... A yeah. bell to speak of. Uh, there's not even a digital bell. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a bell or a window or a bell for you to throw it out of. It's crazy. <laughs> you know, there's also a particular type of church structure that and a lot of parishes used to have. And Father Rich, as you're building your parish, I think this is uh, something to consider. It's called an exconjatory. Now, an exconjatory was like a small detached building. Um, and this gets into the sacramental nature of it because... The bells in the campanile and in the belfry were meant as more of a communication thing to say, you know, times of mass and whatever. But the bells in the exconjatory, which is like a small square building on the grounds of the church, was used particularly as a sacramental. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll get into, you know, how bells are consecrated and everything. But this was a almost like a tent made out of brick, open to the four cardinal directions. So if you were having a famine... If you were having a terrible storm, if you were um, about to be invaded, this building was meant to ring the bells as a blessing of the lands that could hear that, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like, um, like, a, like a rogation, right, where you're going around the parish bounds. This bell and its ringing and its sound waves were meant to ward off storms, hails, 
f- droughts, famines, those mm-hmm. types of things. Mm-hmm. So you should mm-hmm. build next conjugatory. So that's really cool. Yeah, and, and, and get rid of all these mosquitoes down here in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> right? Damn you, it's, mosquitoes! It's a very important ministry to a local community, and we we become so reliant on you know, the immediate access to food, immediate access to communication. I mean, heck, Amazon's taking over the food industry and their partnerships with Whole Foods and all these different, you know, forms of making life more slothful for people. (laughs) But what if all of that completely, the bottom falls out on it? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and it happens. It That's does. a cyclical nature of history. It happens. It, it does. Right. The so, Romans never thought that the world was going to turn into, you know, the hard times they did. Yeah. The Ottomans, you know, were a well. I think I myth think, to the Byzantines before their whole world collapsed. You I know? think the American church and the institution of suburbs and you know different things like that. I think I think there is sort of a natural loss of this because of the use the use cases for mm-hmm. it. Right. It's like why are we going to have a bell when I can give them a bulletin and they can come. And so maybe the appropriation of bells outside of obviously the liturgy was something that we didn't, we didn't need this anymore. And so people thought, well, you know, we don't need to ring a bell to tell people about mass anymore. And they Mm -hmm. missed all the other sort of consequences of having that. Bingo. And I think that's such a great point because now we have all of these accommodations that we can use to communicate. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the expense Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's all going to come down to expense. Mm-hmm. There is a there's a substantial expense for a real, real bell. bell to be yeah. cast, yeah. but isn't an expense that's worth it? Yeah. Hopefully, this show and what we're digging up in history and what we're going to be delivering here is yes. Yeah. I mean, it is an expense that we want to want to make effort toward because of the effect of what the bells you know, are. You know, everyone says, "Oh, the smells and the bells." Yeah. Well, we can still get the smells. I'm getting the smells from you guys, but we get the smells in church, right? You know, <clears throat> incense, even when it's probably Sometimes. not used as much as it should be. Right. But you don't get the bells as much anymore. And and that's a shame because the smells and bells, it's the auditory, it's the olfactory, it's the, it, they're different senses that call you to worship. And it's literally Pavlov, when he was training a dog, he can make his body of the dog react by ringing a bell. It's something that's, you know, uh, physiological. And by allowing yourself to be, uh, I guess, uh, you know, trained, I'll say it, allow yourself to be trained that when that bell rings, your body goes into a mode ready for worship is a good thing. It's a discipline, mm-hmm. you know? And going back to, you know, the, the bells tolling at the death of someone within your community, right? It would move you to a sense of empathy, compassion, and in that place of perhaps grief and and a momentary sadness, you know, a transitory sadness, that you would enter into prayer in that place. Well, isn't that what we remember when we come to Mass is the death of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Like, he died for our salvation and he rose triumphantly. Those bells toll to come and remember the death of all deaths and the firstborn of the dead in Jesus Christ. So, again, the importance of communicating that on, a, on, on the most fundamental basis uh, has to be communicated through bells. Yeah, you know, there's the, the Hemingway book, For Whom the Bell Tolls, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's about, well, for who died, right? So there was the tradition of a way of ringing bells for when someone died. And those are called the death knell. We've all heard that term, but the death knell was a particular way to ring a bell. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's, so here's how they would do it. Um, if a man died, it was three bells. If it was a woman who died, it was two bells. So, okay, well, three bells, you know, Briscoe P. Coltrane died. Two bells, well, you know, Mary Slender died. Okay. Mm-hmm. So now we know who died. Well, when we know a man or a woman died. Then they would ring out the age of the person that many times. So you say, okay, a man 52 died. Well, that's Howard, okay? Um, so you would immediately know, and then you could start to pray for them. Um, and then there would be all different kinds of bells, right? So there's a passing bell, like saying someone was close to dying. There is a way to communicate that. The death knell is what we just described. And then there was 
the corpse bell, which was saying, okay, the funeral's happening. And this was all just like a very rudimentary public announcement system. This yeah. is like texting, I mean, yeah. you know? Yeah. And now it, it's tragic too, it, within the life of the church, that funerals become a private matter. Baptisms become a private matter. Weddings? They were making wedding, were weddings clearly a private matter. Uh, First Holy Communions, a yeah. private matter. Mm. You know, we, we've completely, like, we've already had weddings within the Sunday congregation. We have bells at the beginning of the Mass. We ring the bell. We enter in. We have the Sanctus bells, which are these. And, <clears throat> you know, all of these sacraments that we celebrate within the church and these rites of becoming are becoming privatized and it restricts the joy of the community because the whole community should be gathered yeah. around. Well, it damages the sense of community. How is there a community if you don't celebrate yes. things together? That's yes. communal. That's where the Correct. word comes from. Yeah, we, we um, and our, our pastor does a really good job of this, like after First Holy Communion, because we have like 10,000 families or something crazy. So he's, he has to like have this fluid way of dealing with sacraments and like he tells first holy communion it's like you know come and, and wear your suit wear your dress for a week so we can two weeks or three weeks so we can tell everybody that you've received first mm -hmm. holy communion people clap for them you know things like that I, there's nothing more joyous than seeing somebody come into the church mm -hmm. or see receive first holy communion like that needs to be celebrated mm -hmm. it's just like an altar where it, it what it does is it congregates everybody around the reverence of God and the sacramental life of the church and the community that he's established yes. in his kingdom, right? Like, so even if you do put a bell in, maybe it's, you still send an email out to everybody. Hey, I want to welcome these people into the church. Like if you see them at mass, like, you know, that's, that's a proper synthesis of tradition and the visceral and the modern and the digital. Like it's not that hard but there's no con conscientious effort to go towards that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and there's hyper personalized world. We mentioned Amazon and like Netflix and even like entertainment and video games and all these different things that people just absorb themselves in. So independent of the world, it's so independent of human interaction. Mm -hmm. um, in and a the, big way. the false premise is, well, I'm connecting to the whole world. I'm connecting it's, to all people. It's the, the big lie of technology. Mm -hmm. The big lie because mm -hmm. they're not. They're not your friends. That's not human interaction. No, and, and they, they had a, a, I think it was Oculus. Uh, there was a, a commercial. I'm sure you've seen this, but, you know, they're, they're immediate neighbors, and they're both playing a, the same type of video game on a Oculus. Hogwash. And, and then it's like, you know, oh, I can't stand my neighbor. He makes all this noise next door, and they're like the best of friends that they've established online in the metaverse, mm. you know, and, and it's this like they commercial? can't stand yeah. each other. You know, it's like, hey, keep it down over there. And they're like, both playing uh, the game and being loud, and they're knocking on the door. Hey, you're being too loud. And they, you uh, know, as neighbors, don't like each other. But, you know, when they're well, in the they're, metaverse, they're, they're playing they're, Jesus Christ now. They're bringing people together, right? The, but they're, they're not. They're, they're showing a chord through. Yeah. We're going, we're going down a rabbit hole of even greater isolation if yeah. we don't realize that the intimacy of love of neighbor that Christ has motivated. Yeah comes into the form of the poverty of my immediate neighbor and living in community with that with that person, yeah. but also the, to celebrate the joys of that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when we have our first Holy Communion here at St. John Paul II, it's everybody knows we have 110 kids re receiving first Holy Communion this year, and they're going to be coming with their families to all of our masses. So we may have 10, 15 kids, and they're receiving communion with with the congregation mm -hmm. and they're dressed in their white and they're celebrated by the people. You know, they're, it, it, we're taking a step in the right direction. Is it not where I want it to be? Uh. I'm happy with where it is right now, but we're moving in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to we have to look at that as it relates to who we are as Catholics, what we do in our praxis of, of the faith, what we have done and what we need to retain because right. we, we've got to bring some of this to the forefront of our practice once again and to recover it. And, and certainly the way we celebrate sacraments, the bells, um, are, are simple ways that we could take a step in a good direction. Mm -hmm. So let, let's move into how a church bell is actually consecrated, how it becomes, you know, not just a ringing thing, but something that actually is in a form, even in hearing it, a blessing. Because mm -hmm. the bells, when you hear a consecrated bell, 
in its form is a blessing and a sacramental in that it gives you wow. grace. Right? There, there's a baptism associated. Yeah, that's what I want to talk about. A baptism associated with the bell. Now, it's not a baptism in the sense of a person I'm being worried baptized. worried about you, Bill. You are not baptized. <laughs> <laughs> I'm concerned about your salvation. Do you believe in digital science? (laughs) (laughs) So you're not actually baptizing. That's a colloquialism, right? That's a it's a a christening. It's 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 a consecrating and consecrating. That's right. Mm -hmm. So what would happen, and what still happens, is that the consecration of a bell has to be performed by a bishop. That's how important it is. Now. Uh, what will happen is they will say a certain, uh, you know, liturgy right. over it, a mm-hmm. rite over yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Um, they will dip it in a particular, they will rinse it down or dip it in holy water, specifically blessed for the blessing of bells. Then they will rub it with anointing oil. Mm-hmm. So th- uh, seven times on the outside and four times on the inside, right? So the four times on the inside are for the... Um, so, because that's where the thing's hitting, so that it's going to the four cardinal directions, and the seven times on the outside are for you know the the gifts of the Holy Spirit, yeah. the virtues, right? Mm-hmm. And the uh, the seven anointings correspond to the seven occurrences of the words "vox domini," the voice of the Lord within the Psalms. Oh wow! You know, and and um, you know the seven crosses exactly as these words are being sung during that psalm. Um, but yeah, the, the number seven, as it relates, you know, we've done a show on numbers in the Bible. Um, it, it, you know, there's something to be said about that. Mm-hmm. And now, so Father Rich, if you are to put in, you know, church bells in your new parish, mm-hmm. it used to be that only the bishop can bless it. Now priests can, but they have to have a special permission from the Vatican to be able to consecrate a church bell. Mm-hmm. And I love the words that they use. So after the anointing and the washing with the holy water... Um, they say, and there's a part of the prayer that says, whoever assembles at the sound of this bell, bell may be free from all temptations of the enemy and ever follow the teachings of the Catholic faith. Mm. So whoever hears this sound and assembles by it, may they have this protection, this spiritual protection. It's a really cool thing. Amen. Um, and something else is, so another reason why kind of the common term is calling it a baptism or a christening is because every church bell has a name. Yep, They're specifically named, named mm-hmm. after a saint. And it's, it's a metaphorical baptism, but, yeah. but the naming and the identity of that bell and the inscriptions on it, it, it gives a character of the mission mm-hmm. and the identity of the bell and what, what its purpose is. So for. would you name yours John Paul II? I mean, like, because you're in his parish, or would you name... Would you name it after another saint? I may name it Stanislaus, I, you know. Stanislaus. Saint Stanislaus, yeah. Awesome. That makes me hungry just listening to his name. <laughs> Stanislaus. Stanislaus. Yeah. It's just your, your... I'm just hungry. You need lunch. Yeah, you yeah. need lunch. <laughs> but here's the thing. Whoever does determine the name, it was an honorary thing. You are the bell's godfather because mm. you are the one giving the name to this bell. So the name of the bell is actually recommended by the Godfather. So there's mm. a lot of parallels to baptism, you know? Wow. All right, so now is the bell getting married now? I mean, like, what the are God, we talking the about well, see, when the big, to the Godfather. I mean, you know, you're the Godfather now. You're going to send him off to marriage. See, when, with? When, when a male bell loves a female bell, <laughs> they, they want to have little baby bells, right? <laughs> Look little, at that cute little baby little, bell. Little baby, a little bambino, a oh. little... Because uh, it starts with this sound. That's when we all recognize. And then nine months later, where, where? I'm a little too dead to boot them. You guys are obviously hungry too. <laughs> hungry for love. Oh baby, I'm hungry for love. Um, there's Ooh, also cool. they're also going to put inscriptions yes. on the side of the bell, and so that when the bell rings, the ringing of that bell and that inscription is saying that prayer in the form of the bell's vibration. And I so think cool. that's super cool. Mm-hmm. This is a really cool topic. It is. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's a lot of them that, you know, there's all kinds. There's like even a book on the different inscriptions of the bell. But one of the um, more common ones that you would see is, to the, I to the church the living call, and to the grave do summon all. Mm. So that's what this bell is saying. Mm-hmm. I'm calling you to church, and I also summon you to the grave as well. Mm-hmm. So it's from birth to death. You come to church, you die, and this bell is going to announce that. 
you know, I think a great name for a bell would be Gabriel because it is really enunciatory. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a nice idea. Yeah. You know, speaking of Gabriel, the whole sense of the Annunciation and the Angelus. When I, when, when I was at Ave Maria University, my alma mater, where I studied undergrad, we had 6 a.m., noon, 6 p.m., and you heard the bell ring throughout the entire campus. Mm -hmm. It was in a tower, and you could see it. You could you could hear it for probably a two block radius, and you would stop wherever you were, whether you were in class, whether you were in the lunchroom, yeah. if you were on the way somewhere, you would stop and you would pray it with those who are most immediately around you, and it, it's it's an awesome devotion. And the Angelus, the bells in the Vatican are rung. That's right. And the Angelus is led by the Holy Father practically if he's around every Wednesday. Yeah, and that's what the bells are for. That is one of the things they do. That's one of the things that I think Muslims really beat us in is that no matter where in the Muslim world, yeah. you hear the call from the minaret and prayer. everyone stops yeah. and yeah. prays. Now, church bells used to do it's that. Impressive. You used to have that. You would have it at the liturgy of the hours. The bells would ring and everyone would stop to pray, particularly at yeah, the Angelus. The canonical <laughs> hours, and, that, and that's yeah. something that we haven't touched on. The canonical hours were always told. Yeah, they were told the bells. by the bell. Yeah. You know, well, and we they should still make an app that does it on your phone. That's true. I mean, in like monasteries, something. they are. Yeah, in monasteries, they still are. But that would be cool. Like, look, your bell rings, you know. But, but like, just a reminder, like, I mean, I, obviously you can have a, a alarm set up or whatever, but something as a reminder of a call to prayer, because mm -hmm. the angel is such a powerful prayer. I mean, Absolutely. It, it really is. Um, during World War II, they had a big bell system set up in Washington, D.C. to pray for the end of the war to ring at the time of the Angelus. And people in Washington, D.C. would stop at the time and pray for the end of the war by praying the Angelus. Did that toll from the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception? Um, I think it was more in, like, within, you know... From the White House. Yes, not, not from the White House, but from some building there. But it could have been from the Immaculate. Yeah, because uh, I think I remember something from the Immaculate it Conception. It might have been. Yeah. They have a, they have a really cool it's campus there. It's one of the nicest in the United States. It's huh? a huge tower, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it is the, it's the largest church in the United States, and they have... In the Western it, Hemisphere. They have secret... Yeah, truly... They have secret windows um, behind the scenes uh, overlooking Washington, D.C. that nobody really sees. And in each stained glass window, it has the founding of our country in Washington, D.C., and in the sense of, of the light that emanates within and the light that goes out when you're looking through these stained glass windows out over D.C., um, it's it's a sense of praying for yeah you know well, our that's, country. That's the basilica where it resembles the consecration that we made to Our Lady. Mm -hmm. You know, as mm -hmm. a country. Yeah, that we our, are consecrated our to Our Lady. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's very our true. Is. Now here's an interesting thing: you are not supposed to ring any bells during the Triduum. Yeah, from Holy, Holy Thursday, Thursday to the yeah. Easter Vigil, yeah. no bells. But and then at the Gloria, oh man, it's like. There a lot go. louder than that, yeah. but whatever. <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> but whatever. Uh, another cool use of bells. Sorry to disappoint you, you <laughs> Delacroix. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> but I really do. So another cool thing of, of uses of bells in the church is that in basilicas, basilicas are a particular church set aside by papal right. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, they are, they're elevated to a higher status. Basilicas will have a particular bell in them, all of them, called a tintinabulum mm. that is only rung when the Pope preaches in that particular basilica. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a sign of the Pope's Anticipated uh, pilgrimage to to that basilica. Exactly. You know, you don't have that in a cathedral. You don't have that in a parish church. Mm -hmm. Only in a basilica to show its special character mm -hmm. as being set aside by and, the pope. And you may have a cathedral basilica, like in our case, That's the right. cathedral basilica of Saint Augustine, right here in Saint Augustine, Florida. We have uh, a bell like that, but also a umbrellina, which is a half erect umbrella. Which, in tradition, you would you would yeah. basically process. The pope would process, and this umbrella would. Uh, defend him from the elements, essentially. Mm -hmm. hmm. Now, there's two more things I want to talk about, but and we're going to talk about how bells are used to exercise demons, and then also how bells are used during the consecration. But before we do that, I want to ring a bell because we're going to talk about something important here. We are going on a pilgrimage to Fatima. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be going this November, and 
why don't you talk a little bit why Fatima is so important for yep. us to go to? So I'm glad that you rang the bell because we are going to the Bellum Tower in Lisbon as one of our destinations, which is really one of the most impressive bell towers in the world. Mm -hmm. And Fatima being so uniquely associated with who we are as the talk show, our family that we've developed. You know, St. John Paul II has been a huge part of, of everything that we do here. That was our first pilgrimage, and unfortunately, COVID shut that down. We were going for the 100th birthday of JP2, and, you know— Couldn't I, go because of COVID, but I think Fatima's— I believe uh, JP2 had his hand in this to, to kind of direct our community to look to Fatima. Yeah, not to me, to Mary. Yeah, yeah. and and that that is JP2's essence, totus mm -hmm. tuus Maria. He's directing us to Fatima to go pray and to have fellowship and develop our community life November 5th through the 12th. We do have a potential extension we're going to tell you about in just a little bit, especially for people in the Ponte Vedra area. That's right. Uh, because there's going to be an extension uh, to Ponte Vedra as well as Santiago de Compostela. But the heart of this pilgrimage is really going to Our Lady of Fatima and going to visit her and entrusting and consecrating our efforts and growing in our faith. Pilgrimage is a phenomenal way to really enrich your faith journey in Christ and develop a great sense of love of neighbor. Yeah, we're so, also going to Porto, yeah. which is where port wines come from. There's the, a nice little tour that we We're going to have a know. great wine tasting yeah. uh, experience there. Mm -hmm. The birthplace of St. Anthony of Padua, mm -hmm. your namesake, your middle yeah. name, and your confirmation name. Yeah, we're going to also, well, we're going to be able to go to the Shrine of Our Lady Fatima. That's the highlight of the trip. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to get the chance to go celebrate to mass, and celebrate, celebrate mass, mass every, day. every single day, confession. We're going to get to venerate the uh, the saints of the, of the visionaries of Fatima, uh, Jacinto and Francisco Marto and Sister Lucia. Uh, we're going to go to a really cool place called the Shrine of Good Jesus of the Mountain. It's this hilltop shrine surrounded by this lush forest. Um, it's like an ancient Baroque thing. It's going to be, it's really cool. We're going to all kinds of cool places. The birthplace of St. Anthony, a, a site of a Eucharistic miracle from the 13th century, uh, these beautiful sites in Lisbon, Our Lady of Fatima. It's eight days. You're going to get to go with us. And here's the cool thing about Fatima and Portugal is that it's not a far flight from the United States. That's what I love the most about it. The it's fact a, it's that like it's a five-hour like five, flight, flight. From, yeah, New York or Boston. Yeah. That's Miami. Miami. Yeah. That's great. So mm -hmm. if you're interested, go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Fatima. This will sell out. We've Just had like so ours. much demand. Yeah, the, 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 the hundred <clears throat> people for the hundred years of John Paul II— was sold out very quickly, mm -hmm. and this and and the price for this is very affordable. Yep. It includes your fight. It includes your lodging. It includes a lot of the meals. It includes you know admission to a lot of these places. It's very affordable, a very manageable trip. And after we've been locked in the house for two years, let's get on pilgrimage. Let's pray together. Let's meet and let's go and do something that's a memory that you'll have for a lifetime. It's true. All right. So let's get back into bells, ringing the bell. I think one of the most important things and something that is always very special to me is during mass is the ringing of the bell during the consecration. Mm -hmm. You know, I mentioned that Pavloni, Pavlovian response earlier, but when I hear the Sanctus bell, I immediately know that the epiclesis has happened. Yes. I know and that that's where the priest's hands are extended over the gifts of bread and wine. That is precisely at the moment epiclesis that the Holy Spirit the author of the sacramental life of the church is the catechism, and most recently Pope Francis affirmed, you know, the epiclesis takes place. Our faith, we come to encounter the incarnate, incarnate Son of God under the appearance of bread and wine, and we fulfill this, do this in memory of me. So yeah. at the epiclesis, the bells ring with the single, mm -hmm. and then at the elevation of the, of the host, and the chalice, you hear. And that's when Jesus becomes. Mm -hmm. That's when transubstantiation yeah, has been affected. And yeah. a number of traditions um, at the conclusion of the reception of the chalice. So the, the priest, when he communicates with the host, and then at the chalice, when it touches his lips, and then the yep. communal hymn begins. Mm -hmm. And then in, in that communal worship of, of singing to our God, we are all communicating 
with God our Father, through Christ our Lord, liturgically, and we are receiving full communion with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Yeah. Boom. Bring them back, churches. Get them. They're not expensive. But it is something that deeply, as the Eucharist affects us both spiritually and physically, because it is true spiritual food and true physical food, the bells do the same thing. They are a physical sound that we hear, but it also lifts up our spirit. So mm-hmm. the, the, the Sanctus bells during the consecration, just it really should happen. And again, it's something that is our patrimony as church. This is something that belongs uniquely to us, and we should be using it and celebrating instead of uh, disregarding it for simplicity's sake. Mm-hmm. Simplicity is a fine thing, but so is ornamentation. So mm-hmm. is you know, calling out in, in joy and in, in sacred mystery the things that we believe to be life-giving and, uh, you know, mystical. Now, last thing I want to talk about church bells is that church bells are a powerful tool against demons and against dark forces. Uh, it was, it's always been believed that the purity of the sound of a bell, that, that pure ring, is something that is particularly abhorrent to the profane devils and demons, right? That bell ringing so purely and harmoniously, the whole thing vibrating yes. is repugnant to a demon. Mm-hmm. And, and we are all subject to that, that sound that draws us into harmony and beauty. Mm. And, and you look at d- demons and demonic influences, it's all ordered toward discord mm. and disorder. Mm-hmm. And this is ordered. This is all the crystalline structure of a metal vibrating in harmony and unison you know, it's it's something about that unity of sound and, and purpose. And one of the things that they would write inside of church bells, um, or like if you had multiple bells in the belfry, one of them would be at least for the, uh, um, I guess, conjuring demons. And they would write inside of it something to the effect of, the sound of this bell vanquishes tempest, repels demons, and summons men. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they would get as many bells because, you know, it's kind of like... Uh, yeah, it's an assault. Yeah, it's a foot. It's assault. Like, look, we got a big arsenal. Yeah. You know, we're ringing yeah. more bells to scare more demons. Yeah, and and the the churches that do have more bells, it's essentially to cover a greater distance. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, again, it's a sacramental. It's been blessed. It's been consecrated, just like holy water, just like salt. Whereas, you know, holy water, you know, you feel it on you. Salt is used as a perimeter, but the bells, it's physical way of transferring the sacramental nature is through the auditory. It's such a cool thing. And mm-hmm. I think just as a, as the church, we really should be more proud of our tradition and our history of bells, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, you asked if the Orthodox do it. They ring the bell seven times a day. Okay. Mm-hmm. But uh, Father Rich, any other thoughts about bells? Anything that's going to leave their heads ringing as we leave? <laughs> Well, let, let's look at it. Let's look at it this way. If, if the bells are symbolic of the logos that created, you know, all that is seen and unseen, um, you know, and we're ringing these bells throughout tradition from Judaism to every sect of Christianity within the Catholic and universal church, the, the necessary ringing of bells has to return to the fullness of the practice of the church. Mm -hmm. And I do hope that we all respond with bells ringing because Christ is still with his church and we need to proclaim that. And the way to proclaim it to the masses and to geographical regions... And communally. Yeah. Get us back to the community. And, 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 And the geographical unity and solidarity that we need to evoke through the church's mission has to be regional and to and to communicate that in sacrament in a sacramental form you know the the sacrament of bells mm-hmm. you know the sacramental that is a bell that is named and commissioned with the anointing and inscripted and inscripted for this service needs to toll again mm-hmm. so join us in that effort by praying for a restoration of the use of real bells and Again, if you haven't had a chance, go to YouTube, click the bell, hit the subscribe button, become a patron, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we will continue to build out the fabric of our faith on the digital continent and ring those bells even into the interwebs. 
God bless you guys. It's great to be with the Catholic Talk Show. See you next week. Mm.